Uh, it was a great opportunity. I, I love the island, and you know, hopefully, we can open up an office down there. We have some business partners and some investors uh, from Bermuda. So my goal is to open up a jurisdiction in Bermuda at some point uh, when it makes sense. Hello, this is Abhilash Jaykumar, co-founder and managing director of Trust Vista. On today's Trust Vista talk, I have the pleasure of being joined by Mark Jennings. Mark is a managing director with New York-based VCP. He joined in 2019 and brings over 20 years of industry experience, having previously held positions in capital raising, high net worth client advisory, trading and portfolio management at Morgan Stanley, LOM Securities, the Blackstone Group, and GSO Capital, and Highbridge Capital Management, as well as Allianz Bernstein. VCP is an alternative investment focused financial services firm with headquarters in London and offices in New York, Tokyo, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. Mark, I can tell you're in the office today. Which office are you in? I'm in the New York City office, the only office. <laughs> yeah, well, speaking about, you know, not going on the traditional path, you know, you went from a Blackstone to a boutique advisor firm. But if we go even further back, you didn't have the traditional, you know, fancy college campus recruiting for that Wall Street banking type of program. What was your first job? Uh, I started as a paper play actually uh, in, in Westchester County where I'm from. And, you know, my dad would, you know, go pick up stacks newspaper, sit on the back of his 9-11, you know, uh, Saab turbo and throw them on the front doorsteps of people's houses. I dropped them off at the apartment complexes. So you got, I think I got 15 wait, cents wait, per- I didn't interrupt you, Mark. So for younger people listening to this, can you explain to them what a paper is? <laughs> a paper? <laughs> well, you... I'm a little bit older than you, Avi. So a newspaper is, uh, you know, something you actually read that you don't read on your computer, on your phone, on your iPad. So back in the day when, you know, us old folk, uh, we'd actually have to drop them off at people's houses and apartments. So that's how I, I like to say, like Warren Buffett, I start, you know, I started delivering newspapers and then I... Uh, you know, I kind of, I, I came from a hundred year old family construction company. So I started, as soon as I started getting in trouble as a kid, my father sent me to the job site and he didn't want me to have energy again trolling anymore. So I, I started as a laborer sweeping floors and digging ditches. And every year I, I you know, I was an apprentice for electrician, plumber, carpenter. When I graduated college, uh, I was the superintendent of a job site. I built a Costco when I was 21 years old. I had 50 guys working for me, but you know, I learned to use my brain instead of my muscles and uh, you know, it was a good learning experience to work my way up. It didn't matter that my dad or grandfather or father, you know, were the chairman, CEO and uh, founder of the companies. Uh, you know, I had to work my way up and earn that respect. You know, when we talk about developing skills when you're young, you know, you don't always appreciate how you're going to apply them later in your career. And the analogy I often draws to the Karate Kid movie, the original one, right, uh, where, you know, it's a wax on, wax off, paint the fence, sand the deck, where, you know, you think you're doing something, some thing that's a bit rote, but you're really developing skills that are going to translate much later in your career. Can you maybe share with me those jobs you had early in your career, the paper route, working in constructions, how are those directly applicable to you being a managing director in a financial services firm today? You know, it kept me humble. Um, it, it, you know, I think you have to understand the plumbing on how something works, whether you're building a, a Costco or, or starting from, you know, I started out of college as a mutual fund accountant. Uh, you know, and worked my way up, you know, I got into this business in 2000 at, uh, at Blackstone. I helped raise a billion dollar fund between my junior and senior year. I was supposed to work 500 hours, ended up working a thousand hours. And, uh, you know, it, it, and then I interned at Prudential Securities in Wheeling, West Virginia, where I went to college, which was a lot different than 345 Park. So, you know, I think those lessons I learned um, helped me develop into the, you know, business professional I am today. And, you know, I think you can learn something from anyone and, uh, you know, whether you're a paper boy or a laborer or, you know, uh, a, a mutual fund accountant out of college, I think that there's an opportunity to learn. You got to figure out what you don't want to do before you can kind of figure out what you do want to do. It took me 20 years to get back to doing something that I love. And, uh, you know, it's just good to be appreciated and, and valued as a, a team member and, and, you know, doing something that I'm passionate about. You know, you left from Blackstone to a boutique advisory firm. And obviously, starting your career in 2000, you'd gone through the tech bubble burst, you know, financial crisis, 2008. 
What was the motivating factor for you to make that switch? Yeah, don't forget 9-11. I was down there for that as well at Bank of New York, which was, you know, a, a huge transition. But, um, you know, I do better actually in a smaller environment. I've worked through some of the biggest Wall Street firms on the street, you know, Blackstone, Bank of New York, uh, you know, Alliance Bernstein, Hybrid, GSO, back to Blackstone. Uh, but I, you know, just like I went to a small boutique college in Wheeling, West Virginia on a full swimming scholarship, um, you know, I would go to the teacher's house and, and he'd teach me calculus on his front porch and his wife would bring out lemonade. You know, I do better in a small environment. So I think you're appreciated a little more sometimes because your work is so prevalent in the day-to-day -day operation of the company. When you're at a big, huge firm, and, and believe me, I was at Blackstone when it was, you know, we raised the first billion dollar fund there, and now they're, you know, one of the largest private equity firms in the world. Um, but, you know, I think there's something to be said working at a boutique firm and, and kind of working your way up and, and being recognized for the, you know, the contributions that you bring to the team when it's not as prevalent when it's, you know, 10,000, 20,000 employees. When you're one of 20, you know, you're either you're going to do the work and get credit or you're not going to be there very long. Yeah, when, you, when you talk about you know, relationships and being recognized, I think you're someone that I see takes a genuine interest in the people you interact with. Uh, you invest a lot in building those relationships. And I recently learned that you actually tapped out your LinkedIn account, which I didn't know was possible, that you can actually have an upper limit on how many people you can be connected with. So for people who are listening, that number is 30,000. So you have 30,000 connections and you cannot connect with anyone <laughs> hereafter. So That's correct. how does one develop such networks and maintain them and keep them meaningful? Because there are a lot of folks who connect people but don't really know them or know where they met them. You know, When did you have a structured approach to building relationships? Yeah, I think it's something that instilled my family, instilled on me at a young age. And I just, you know, uh, you know, I always believed in kind of paying it forward and helping people. So many people helped me out throughout my career that I could have never gotten to where I am today without them. And, um, you know, I just, I cast the net as wide as possible. And I think you can learn something, as I said earlier, from anyone, uh, you know, no matter whether they're in your industry or not. Um, you know, I'll connect, I, I connected with everyone that asked me to connect with them. And I connected with everyone that I thought was, you know, meaningful relationship that I thought could help, you know, me or I could help them throughout my career. So, you know, I think your, your network is your net worth is uh, my communications uh, colleague told me to uh, plug, but um, you know it's all about who you know. You know what you know keeps your you know keeps get you know keeps you there. But who you know gets your foot in the door, and I think it's very important to stay in touch with your alumni, stay in touch with your you know high school or college friends. You, you never know. You know, small Wall Street's a small place, and you, know, you never want to burn any bridges. You always want to uh, you know keep in touch with people because you never know when you're going to need that relationship at some point and you want to make sure it's a meaningful one. So when you meet someone new who tries to add you on LinkedIn, how, how do you tell them that you can't? Or do you have to drop someone? Well, you have to drop someone to, to connect with them. You know, I have to change it now so people can follow me. I can follow people. Uh, there's no limit to that. But connecting, you know, I have to go through and, and now and kind of comb my network and see, you know, who uh, is worth, uh, you know, dropping. It's, it's a tough decision. I, I went through. I tried to go into certain jurisdictions that I, I can't do business with. And even those jurisdictions, there's some really senior executives that I've connected with over the years. And it's, it's, it's hard to pick and choose. I have like 50 connections that people have made over the last week that I haven't been able to accept because uh, I can't accept anymore. So hopefully they don't uh, get upset with me, but hopefully I'll, I'll be able to clean out the, uh, the connections and be able to accept them shortly. Well, in full transparency, I'm only doing this podcast with you because I don't want to get dropped from your LinkedIn. <laughs> Uh, oh, come on, Avi. You know, yes. you're a trusted friend and, and, and colleague and, you know, we can't thank you so much. You know, you've, uh, you know, I think of all the people who referred me to people the last year or two, uh, you, you're definitely on top of the list. So I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to you today. Yeah. Well, when I think of networking, I always tell, especially when younger folks are trying to connect with me, I say, you know, that's fine. But to be a meaningful network, it has to be mutual, right? What can each party bring to the table? And it's not about networking because you need something right networking is more of a behavior so that when you actually might need something people who are already in your network can be leveraged um and so i think people who are only doing it for a specific purpose at a specific point in time are missing the point it's really about relationships
Yeah, for me, it's always got to be a two-way street. You know, I always want to see how I can help someone, how they can potentially help me. And, you know, it doesn't have to be work-related. It could be, uh, you know, personal. It could be, you know, family, um, business. You know, I, I think for a meaningful relationship, it has to be a two-way street. You're right. Maybe we can talk now about where you are right now and the role that you stepped into. So you joined VCP, I guess, gosh, it's been two years now, and it's been a very interesting two years. Can you kind of give us a background of what brought you to VCP and what you've been doing since? Yeah, so I got introduced to VCP from, uh, you know, one of our largest clients, uh, Greenspring. I had met them down in Bermuda, actually. I met the father, uh, Chuck Newall at NEA, and he introduced me to his son, Ashton, and we hit it off right off the bat. And, uh, you know, we became good friends and he would invite me on their corporate outings. And, you know, I tried to help them uh, down there in Bermuda and, and while my time at Morgan Stanley and then just kept in touch. I actually applied for a, a junior analyst role at his company when I woke up one day and was just, you know, looking to the best, trying to figure out, you know, why I even got into this business. And uh, I had to look all the way back to when I started my career at Blackstone in 2000 and I helped raise that fund. But that's what I fell in love with. That's why I got into this business. So. Uh, you know, Ashton was kind enough to introduce me to uh, Tom Fitzherbert Brockles, who was the counterpart or colleague of mine that I, uh, you know, um, came in to fill his shoes, although they were quite big shoes. He moved on to actually, I knew he was going back to the UK, but he actually went back to head up Greenspring's European division. So, you know, he, he had introduced me to them. We had met, uh, you know, VCP had met them and I had met Greenspring around the same time back in 2000, uh, I don't know, 9, 10. And, you know, they were a $2 billion VC fund now. I think they're $13 billion. And I, I applied for a junior analyst role. And, and Ashton said, look, Mark, that's for kids coming out of college. He said, these kids are making more money than me. And he said, let me introduce you to Tom. You know, we had gone out two years ago. And, you know, every time I come to New York, he asked me for coming out. So we hit, Tom and I hit it off like we were out the night before. And, you know, they had interviewed 100 you know, Harvard, UPenn people. And they couldn't find someone that had the you know, they were looking for someone with the right principles and values and work ethic. And I didn't even have the technical skills. They said, look, we're willing to teach you. We can teach you the technical side. We can't teach you the principles, and values and work ethic. So that's how I got here back in July of uh, 2019. And uh, I've been, it's, it's been down here ever since. It's, it's, it's great. I really enjoy working here. As a placement agent, I think you guys have a a little different model than a lot of placement agents where you incorporate H&Is and family offices quite significantly into your investor base that you're drawing from. How is that helping you guys differentiate yourself from you know, a lot of the other placement agents where they're primarily drawing on institutional LPs? Yeah, so, you know, VCP or originally called Venture Capital Partners was founded by two gentlemen, William, William Rudebeck and Henry Talaponsi. They were investment bankers in 2008, uh, a month after Lehman Brothers had gone under and there was good companies out there that needed help raising money and their boutique investment bank only wanted to raise for, you know, particular opportunities. So they went off on their own. I think they were like 26, 27 years old and they had just great family office relationships in Europe and U S and Asia. And I think they flew around like 240 meetings in the first year and they raised money for 20, 25 companies in the first two to three years. The first one I think was like a Chinese healthcare technology company. And, you know, going back to, they just had great relationships and, you know, we, we set up office here about eight years ago uh, when we had our first VC fund. It might have been Greenspring um, approached us to, hey, you guys are pretty good at raising money for companies. You ever think about raising money for company uh, for funds? And, uh, you know, so that's where our placement business started. We opened an office in Hong Kong, Shanghai. We have a sister company in Tokyo and Seoul. And we went out and we changed the name to VCP because everyone thought we only did venture. So we raised money for private equity and real estate, hedge funds and infrastructure funds. And, you know, um, we advised on about 13 billion over the last 10 years. And about four years ago at a company offsite, a partners meeting, we were trying to figure out, you know, our next business, we wanted to scale really quickly. And, you know, it took us 10 years to advise on 13 billion. We wanted to do it in about half the time. And what we noticed when we opened up the offices in Hong Kong and, and Shanghai, and this is coming to Tokyo and Seoul, is that there's a lot of accredited investors, a lot of sophisticated investors looking to access our opportunities that they're too small. Right. The normal LP is an endowment, a pension, a large family office, um, you know, writing a minimum five, ten million dollar checks where, you know, these are people with five, ten million dollars sitting offshore in U.S. dollars are looking for access to the opportunities. But they want to write a half a million, million dollar check. And they were normally priced out of the, of the market because they're too small. The fees are too high. The, you know, the, the lockup was too long. And, and we, you know, we incubated a company called Byte Investments, which we 
you know, aggregate, uh, you know, accredited sophisticated investors together in a Cayman SEMA regulated feeder fund. And I had done this in Bermuda for that client hedge fund that, you know, I had met at 2 million and, you know, they are up to 160 million. They raised the minimum from a half a million to a million dollars. And, you know, I said, hey, you know, you know, you want to refer to anyone to me that doesn't have a million bucks. And we ended up putting 10 million and now they're the number two hedge fund in the world, number one fund for the last 11 years, 23% always turn. I'm still the only guy who can get people in for 100 grand. So, you know, that's what these guys did in Asia. And now we're in Europe, in the UK. Uh, we're live in, in Singapore and, and Hong Kong and Cayman, Bermuda and, and uh, UK and Europe. And so it's making, you know, it's empowering uh, small investors. It's democratizing alternative investments. It's, you know, why should uh, alternative investments only be for, you know, institutional or ultra high net worth family offices? Interesting, the timing, you guys have done this as well. So obviously you got long history working with H&Is and family offices that let you see this opportunity. But since you guys launched Byte, you know, this has been, apart from the pandemic, a lot of material changes in the alternative investment landscape. You know, last summer, uh, the BOL you know, put out a statement saying explicitly that you know, private equity could be included in 401k type of plans. Um, most recently with the frenzy of you know, retail investors in the public stock market becoming actually material enough to be moving markets with the amount of capital they're now putting in um, with, you know, the unicorn companies pre-IPO with, you know, liquid shares effectively on you know, private uh, share exchanges. Where do you see all of this recent news benefiting your business? Yeah, I think if anything, it's it's reemphasized the fact that you know we're using technology to to tap into pools of capital that traditionally weren't accessible, uh, and investments that weren't accessible to the high net worth and and smaller family offices. So, you know, it's not rocket science. Uh, you know, the reason why big firms are circling us is not because you know don't get me wrong, our technology is amazing and we make it easy for people, right? We educate the consumer, so we try to weed out the people that it is not appropriate for. You, know, you still have to be accredited, sophisticated. We have a very stringent process of bringing through it as an institutional process as possible, you know, reverse solicitations, NDAs for access to data rooms. But you know, the whole purpose is, is not, we don't give advice, we give access. So we're partnering up with the other RIAs and broker dealers and, and firms that don't normally have access to these opportunities as well. You know, we're looking to complement them and their clients uh, to give them access to opportunities to diversify their portfolios. So, you know, it's 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 very relevant in today's day and age when you can't, you know, go to a AGM or a conference or a seminar at least in person. You know, using technology uh, to educate clients and 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 give them access to investments that they wouldn't normally have access to has been very prevalent in this day and age. If we think that there's going to be a lot more retail investors coming into alternatives, what needs to change about the alternative asset management industry in order to accommodate that? Well, I think that, you know, it's a new LP base that they traditionally, you know, didn't consider because, uh, you know, they're just too small or not educated enough in the space. And, you know, I think that now they're seeing that, you know, that business is actually stickier than the institutional business sometimes. And, you know, it's good to diversify, you know, institutional investors sometimes will, you know, the first time they had that, you know, investment isn't doing well they'll drop you where a retail investor will tend to stick with you for a longer period of time and that the relationship is based on trust and, and value and and educating the consumer and, and there's a much bigger uh marketplace out there than you know everyone's going after the same institutional investors right everyone's going after the endowments and pensions and large family offices whereas you know the retail accredited sophisticated investors it's it's a market that hasn't been prevalent i think it's like 0.5 percent of people's 401ks are on alternative investments, which is crazy. You know, if, if the Harvard Endowment or, you know, CalPERS, whoever can have 20, 25% of their portfolio in alternative investments, why shouldn't, you know, a credit sophisticated investor? Um, it just doesn't make sense. From the perspective of the GP, you know, when they think about retail investors as a class of LPs, is it more suited for the small GP, the guy raising two, 300 million? Or is this something also for the mega funds? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think it's relevant for everyone, um, you know, whether it's a green spring or whether it's a, you know, a small, uh, you know, up and coming fund or a new fund, um, you know, it all depends on who it's appropriate for and, and their appetite. So we try to 
give everyone, you know, we're not looking to be a supermarket and have a hundred different funds and, you know, and, you know, we're like the best French restaurant in town. So we're not the deli or the diner that you walk in, you have a thousand different types of, you know, meals on the menu. You know, we would like to have one really good fund on, of each, you know, asset class in alternatives uh, on the platform. So that way, you know, someone can create a well diversified alternative portfolio. And, you know, whether it's the, the largest funds, we just helped raise a hundred million for a late stage, you know, the largest European late stage med tech fund that, you know, you or normal people would never have heard of before. But, you know, just because they're small doesn't mean they're, they're not good. They're, they're, they're amazing. It's just, you know, bigger is not always better. Going back to your specific skill with networking and building relationships, you know, I can see how that might translate to a specific fundraise for a specific fund or a specific company. How does it translate into what you guys are doing on Byte, where you're trying to target basically what might be an infinite audience? Yeah, so, you know, Byte, um, I came in and initially was going to head up the institutional side of the business. And, you know, we did an angel round back in October where we raised, uh, you know, 2.2 million at a $10 million pre money valuation from the three largest Chinese VC family house broker dealers. And, you know, they hadn't invested outside China since 2008, I don't think. And uh, I think we had like seven or eight million worth of term sheets. Um, and, you know, we decided to spin that company out. And I, you know, they asked me, they said, hey, do you want to help raise money for our fintech startup? And I said, sure, thank God, because, you know, 2020 was a tough year, you know, for institutional investors. A lot of the pencils were down. And if you weren't well into the due diligence process and, you know, it was tough to get uh, an institutional investor to write a check, whereas, you know, I was very successful helping raise money for Byte itself. You know, we set it up, uh, a friend of mine, a neighbor who's a CEO of a hedge fund, introduced me to a trust company where people can actually invest through their RA, the IRA or their retirement account, uh, you know, in a self-direct IRA into a, you know, a Cayman regulated feeder fund, uh, you know, premium alternative like Byte. And so that, you know, that was something that opened my eyes because, you know, these retail all credit sophisticated investors, don't normally know that they can access investments like that. You know, someone put their, uh, you know, wine vineyard or their gold mine in their IRA the other day. And I, was, I couldn't believe that that was possible, but it's the most tax efficient way to, to invest in uh, some offshore properties or opportunities like that. So, you know, the point is that, you know, I think that this has become very, you know, relevant in the conversations that we're having with, you know, high net worth credit investors that do need their hand held a little bit and do need to be, educated and, and brought through a, a different process than an institutional investor. But, you know, we try to team up, they can share it with their accountant, they can share it with their lawyer, they can, their advisor can sign on, fill it out all for them. You know, we're trying to make it easy for them and, and educate them at the same time and, and make sure it's appropriate. And this way, you know, five, 10% of your portfolio, you know, we might not be giving you advice, but we show people, this is what you currently have, this is what you should have, this is what, you know, a, a well diversified portfolio would look like and maybe it shouldn't be all in stocks and bonds and ETFs and mutual funds. What, what do you kind of see happening as far as asset allocation? Obviously the stock market has been ripping for the last six plus months, you know, for retail investors, you know, are you seeing that they have the same appetite as they had to before this run for alternatives or right now are they focused on liquid public markets that are generating outsized returns? Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the retail investors I speak to, they are trying to diversify, you know, not 100% being in the U.S., going into emerging markets. You know, we're trying to recreate a highway for, you know, U.S. investors to be able to invest in international opportunities and international investors to be able to invest in U.S. opportunities. So, you know, we think there's something to be said about having a well-diversified geographical uh, portfolio, but also an asset allocation that isn't all you know, public stocks and, and bonds and GFC mutual funds, even though they're not supposed to be correlated, you know, there's something to be said about having a, a private equity or venture capital uh, investment in your portfolio because, you know, it's not daily trading and it's not going to, you know, be as volatile, I don't think, as the public markets would be. Last year was a very difficult environment for fundraising new funds or talking with new LP commitments if they weren't already in the process. What have you seen come, starting this year? Do you see funds going back to market and raising capital, or is it getting pushed out a little bit further? Yeah, I think people are coming back even sooner than they normally would. You know, we've been, it used to be funds that come every three to five years. Now it's like 18 months. Uh, and there's a lot of re-ups and, and, 
you know, it's very difficult to, you know, get someone to drop a, a fund, you know, they have to be a material different, you know, initiator for them to drop, you know, an investor or a client that they've already invested in their fund for another one. Um, you, you know, it's only getting more competitive. And uh, I think that's why this is so prevalent now is that, you know, to be able to add a new LP to the market that can, that can write checks or allocate money into uh, funds is, is very important because you know, everyone is still kind of fighting over the same uh, institutional LPs. And don't get me wrong, they have a huge place in the business, but you know, the more players in the business, the, the, you know, the better it could be. The dynamic of institutional LPs having a roster of managers that they have relationship with and keep re-upping, that's been quite prevalent. You know, the challenge is how do you crack them if you're not already in? And if you're in, then it's a nice recurring kind of revenue of sorts. With the dynamic of retail investors, it lets people in who weren't in before, but that re-upping dynamic, does that still continue to exist or is it less likely that a retail investor is going to have the capital to commit to the next fund? Well, you know, the, the reason we built this was so we can give people the opportunity, you know, they don't have to stay in the investment for, you know, 10, 15 years. They can, you know, they, we can create a secondary market where we can give them liquidity um, you know, there are people that want to get into funds that, you know, they normally didn't have access to because of their size. So, you know, by us wrapping all up and writing one check, we're, you know, we're able to give people that opportunity and they're able to come back in. You know, they're getting an institutional share class of the fund. They're, you know, having capital calls where they don't have to put 100 percent of their money up. They can put 40 percent of it, uh, you know, initially and, and be called over the course of the investment. They might not get called at, at, at the whole thing at all. Uh, you know, they're starting to get returns on their investments before they're f fully deployed or fully invested. So I think if anything, this platform helps them to be able to re-up and, and come into the next one because, you know, empowers them by educating them and understanding the, you know, intricacies of investing in venture capital and private equity and alternative investments. You know, it's not something that they're traditionally taught, uh, you know, coming up in, you know, in the world. It's just not a, a topic that people usually uh, talk about on the retail or credit side of the business. So I think it's, it's about time we did. Going in a different direction for a second, you know, you have offices all over the world that you work with. How do you manage your work-life balance? Personal question, because obviously I have a similar situation, but love to hear from you. What are the things you do to be able to manage that? Yeah, and earlier I said that this is the only office. It's the only office because this is the one I head up. But, uh, you know, we do have offices around the world and it, it is challenging. You know, that was part of the job coming in and knowing that I could, you know, I'm, I'm talking to our founder uh, or CEO, Byte. He's in Hong Kong. Uh, him and I are having calls, you know, either first thing in the morning or late at night. Um, and, you know, our, our headquarters in the UK. So I'm, I'm dealing with the CEO of VCP there and my colleagues there. So it definitely takes, you know, I was a swimmer in college. So I think the time management is very important and being able to, you know, I compete against myself, but I also compete as a team. And that's kind of what swimming and, and athletics brings to the table, I think, is that, you know, you have to be able to manage your time. And believe me, it's one area I have to work on. Um, you know, I just have my review. And, you know, one of the things is working on my, per, you know, separating church and state and, and personal time with my family. I have two daughters. Uh, I have a wife that stays home and takes care of her and she's, a, you know, and she does real estate and, you know, it's been very demanding working from home, homeschooling. Uh, it's tough. You know, I came into the city today just for this interview because I wanted some peace and quiet and the Wi-Fi to work. So uh, I think it's, a, you know, it's definitely a challenge. But if you, you know, if you don't plan, you plan to fail, as my mom likes to say. So I think if you, as long as you manage your time appropriately and, and set enough time for your family and, and yourself personally, you know, you have to concentrate on your you know, well-being and, you know, whether it's fitness or eating right or getting enough sleep. You know, I, I email my colleagues at 2, 3 in the morning. They're like, Mark, what are you doing still up? Like, go to bed. It's, you know, you, and, it, you know, it is important that you have a balanced life. You know, I, I seen some of those emails and the timestamps that you sent to the, your team in India at Tres Vista as well. And, you know, work ethic is commendable. Certainly, you have a tremendous work ethic. But as in, I think it's important for people to understand how much work you have to put into managing uh, your calendar as well, because it's not sustainable otherwise. And I think from this work from home environment, you know, some of those boundaries disappear. A lot of those boundaries disappear. You don't have that commute anymore. So do you just work more during the commute time, you know, or do people kind of know you're accessible? So, you know, how do you create those boundaries and, you know, the separation of church and state, as you put it, to, to, to not burn out? 
Yeah, you know, I taking the train in today, it was actually kind of nice, you know, although, you know, I wore my mask and sat six feet apart. Um, you know, everyone's like, oh, my God, the commute. When I came back from Bermuda, I used to have like a little five minute, you know, zip into town on my Vespa. And now I'm taking a 27 minute train, although today it was 45 because there's only local service. But, you know, there's something you said, it gets you to be able to take off that, that work hat and put on that personal family hat and, and decompose press a little bit you know i'm working just as hard if not harder at home it's just it's like having eight straight hours of sleep versus you know four two hours of sleep and uh you know i might be up at 6 30 for a morning global sales call and then you know help get the kids off to school and pack their bags and my wife god bless she does most of all that and uh but, you know, it's just not the same. It, it, I do miss working in the city. You know, I'm hoping that New York will get back to where it was and, and even better uh, at some point, which I'm sure it will. I've been through this before, being through 9-11 and a few other, you know, instances where the city's been kind of, um, uh, you know, down and out. But, you know, you can never count New York out. And uh, I'm sure we'll be back to work shortly. Going through crisis, as you said, you've gone through 9-11, the financial crisis. Now this one. Uh, there's 11 year gap between the financial crisis and the pandemic and for a lot of young professionals it's their first crisis so their response to it you know is often very severe you know what's happening what's happening with my job and my future and my career how, how did you approach the pandemic when it started just given your history and experience you know i think you know i always put my mind you know i never got anything i got in life you know for free my father sold me my first car twice the blue book value just to get teach me a lesson that i should be checking what the value was and you know i had to work very hard for everything i got and uh you know but i think you put if you put your mind to something you can accomplish anything you know i, I interned at blackstone and try to get a job there at college and seven years later i ended up there you know granted it was through the gso blackstone merger but you know going through a crisis it doesn't define who you are i think you know, that's when the leaders, you know, step up to the plate and, you know, you develop as a person. It's like going to college in Wheeling, West Virginia, where I didn't know anyone, but or moving to Bermuda and not knowing anyone there and meeting some of my best friends in my life in Bermuda. So, you know, I think that it's those challenges that help define your, you know, your personality, your, your work ethic and your, you know, your principles and values. And, I don't see it as a as a deterrent. I think it, I see it as an opportunity for you to show you know yourself and how you stand out against your peers. Fantastic. Well, Mark, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story and your journey and what you've been up to, and uh, really appreciate. It. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. We really appreciate you having me, and thank you so much. Thank you, Trisvista, for your help and support. Our privilege.